Hey, hey, people, Seth here. Are you easily entertained by seeing numbers get higher? Would you like to play the equivalent of that, except all the buttons have been replaced with Chinese symbols? Do you have a burning interest in Chinese martial arts, Taoism, or the pursuit of immortality? Then I invite you to see where my life has spiraled out of control for the past two months. Amazing Cultivation Simulator. Keep in mind, I only paid money for this after 50 hours. I've been playing this for so long that all my ads are in Chinese. Amazing Cultivation Cultivation Simulator is a love letter to Chinese wushu novels, essentially Chinese sword fantasy. The word is like a sound because it's meant to sound like a sword swipe. In the novels, cultivation is the cultivation of one's internal qi through practice, martial arts, meditation, whatever. And qi is the vital breath or essence of our living world, according to the same people who stick needles in your back. The end goal of cultivation is, of course, immortality. And that is what this whole game is about. Essentially, you're going to take a small group of Chinese rice farmers and turn them into demigods. To begin, I need to dispel any notion at all that this is Chinese rim world. I do this by comparing them directly. For example, we need a refrigerator. I'm going to build one. We need a refrigerator. I'm going to drop the frozen soul of a demon and reduce the temperature to absolute zero. The room is too cold. We need air conditioning. The room is too cold. Rebuild it out of wood and make the bed out of fire. Now our disciple won't die of frostbite he'll die of heat stroke. My colonist is crippled, disabled, and completely geriatric. So the cheapest option is to put him down. My disciple is an old disabled nugget. We have regrown each of his limbs. Also, he's now a 14 year old boy. We're under attack by bandits. We should get inside to safety. A man just decapitated my best friend from over 10 kilometers away with a flying fedora. Once you get past the obvious comparisons, you'll never mistake this game for anything else. To begin, you'll need to go through the tutorial. It's very quick and gives you a bit of background to the story. Unfortunately, the English voice acting is questionable. Luckily, this is a fantasy game, so the sound of women is optional. In contrast, the music is lovely and the visuals are gorgeous. Completing the tutorial unlocks the actual game, which is clearly and unambiguously labeled classic, which upon clicking will show a huge list of sliders and settings to scare away the casual guaylo. Don't touch anything, just hit confirm. Next, you're gonna get trolled by the Chinese, because the developers think it's really funny that there's an almost certain guarantee that you just rolled a Yao Guai as one of your starting characters. Let me explain, white boy. In this world, you can cultivate as either a human or a Yao Guai, which translates to monster, but really we're referring to demons. Yao Guai, henceforth referred to as yogurts, are animals that have gained sentience and become humanoid. However, their existence is unnatural, and eventually they have to face tribulation from the heavens. It's sort of like God God's punishment for being a furry. I wish I knew that before. I lost my first waifu to a storm cloud. But because the random character selection randomizes race and 11 out of 12 of those races are different flavors of yogurt, you're very likely to land that. Until you know what you're doing, I don't recommend starting with dairy products. But if you want to speedrun the game, I recommend starting as the fastest animal on land. A turtle. You'll starve to death before you even reach the dinner table. Beyond this point, there's not much advice I can give. You're gonna suffer and you're gonna learn from the experience. So pick your starting perks and get into the game. Everybody recommends True Sun Refining as your starting law because it's got very simple progression. And if you make a mistake, worst case scenario, you'll just die in horrific agony. If you followed the plot, the entirety of a Tai Yi sect has been annihilated. You and a handful of others are the only survivors. Why was it destroyed and by who? Whomst did this? Are questions you'll have to answer if you want to uncover the mystery of a Tai Yi sect. But uh, right now, your primary concern is survival. To help, a mysterious cultivator who was tight with your former sect leader drops by for the next two weeks. As long as he's alive, you're not gonna die. That is, unless you go to the bottom left of the map. In which case, you will both die. Let's get definitions going. You're running a sect, a school of cultivation. A sect has outer disciples that will happily do all of your mundane, tedious labor for a competitive salary of about zero dollars. They're not slaves. As per se, we don't use that word here. It's more like an internship, which never ends. But through a high-intensity jujitsu program known as Foundation, they can become inner disciples. An inner disciple must choose one of the many supreme laws to follow, through which they cultivate a higher state of being. Their progress, abilities, and potential is largely determined by their 
character stats and background. Like RimWorld, everyone in this game generates with a random background, such as congenital defect, seashell collector, and effeminate male. The combination of stats will determine their compatibility with a chosen law. You start with just one, but you'll unlock the rest as the game goes on. Also, they don't have to eat but they still do. It's not uncommon to see a cultivator feasting on ramen, even if there's currently a famine. Especially if we're currently having a famine. Also, pro tip, you start with a single forming pill. This can instantly finish your foundation and give you an inner disciple right at the start. After promotion, you can go to the sect tab and hit establish a sect, and most importantly, give it a cool name. Once that happens, you have officially incorporated. The rest of the game opens up. Inner disciples don't work. They cultivate and get stronger. After all, this is Taoist Dragon Ball Z, but after incorporation, you can send them out to explore the world. There's two options, camp and adventure. Adventure sends them out on adventures. They leave and they come back. Camp sends them out to stay, and if you're so inclined, you can physically enter the map and plunder a village. At the start, your map's gonna look like this. Immediately, you're gonna notice something. One, there's barely any locations because you haven't discovered them, and two, if you try to explore the red zones, you're gonna come home in a body bag, because that's not your territory. So whose is it? A great way to find out is to visit them directly and prank them by sneaking inside their school. Once they catch you, they'll give you a proper introduction. Break your knees, snap your spine, and gouge your eyes out. The other sects aren't very sociable, but diplomacy is important, because if they felt so inclined, they could obliterate us. To even get an audience with them, you have to make an offering. Your offering doesn't matter. Each time, they're gonna call you a broke-ass bitch anyway. That's why we wait for a cow to defecate, mark it as the trade area, and send our gift. Now, you can trade. In a world of immortality, money is an abstract concept, so we're working on a purely barter-based economy. However, we still have a form of currency, and yes, it's completely edible. Spirit stones are the chocolate coins of this world. You can trade them during break time for Pokemon cards or consume them directly to restore a small amount of diabetes. In this case, they restore a small amount of chi, so they function as both a store of wealth and a means of exchange. Each sect offers something different for ridiculous amounts of money, and uh, even if you have a stacks to pay for it, we're not selling. That would be like selling weapons to your enemy. And how do we know we can trust you? So, you have to butter them up. This is mainly done by asking people across the world whether the leader of a sect prefers cats or dogs, and gifting him the appropriate kind of meat. Let's return to matters back at home. Feng Shui is a Chinese system of thought governing spatial arrangement and orientation in relation to the flow of qi. Have a look. Here's some simple Chinese alchemy that I expect you to memorize by about 200 hours of play. Why do I have to learn this? Because everything in this game is subject to Feng Shui. Everything has an element, and they interact with one another. Water nourishes is wood. Wood feeds fire. Fire cools to make the earth. Earth produces metal, and metal holds the water, allowing it to repeat the cycle. Okay, that's cool, Seth, but we don't have time for this. Wait, did my guy just die of heart palpitations? Why is the yin-yang symbol in this bedroom red? What the fuck does ominous mean. When in doubt, check the pentagram. Room of wood, bed of earth. Wood defeats earth, making the feng shui of a bedroom ominous. And if you sleep in that bedroom, you'll die of a heart attack. Replace the earth bed with a fire bed, and as wood feeds fire, the feng shui will become auspicious, which means good. However, if you sleep in that bedroom, you'll die of heat stroke. That's because fire and water control the temperature. In a more relevant scenario, each of the supreme laws practiced by your cultivators has an element. Feng shui affects the speed and success of their practice. So if you're a metal cultivator, you would avoid fire as fire melts metal. However, if you told him to meditate in an empty room and fed him laxatives, the speed of his cultivation would increase with the volume of shit he produces, as feces is the element of earth which promotes metal. If you're confused, I sympathize. There is no way you could possibly know that in Feng Shui, the orientation of a room's door is specific to its function. In other words, bedrooms face south, workshops east, and kitchen west. That's why everything in this game has a comment box, so you and your fellow Guilos can share ideas about what the hell is going on. Now, the main focus of this game is cultivation towards immortality, which can be summarized by the following post. You eat a pill, sit on your ass for several years, and once you're done, you go from rank 8 ping pong to rank 2 ching chong, which is still like 100 ranks below the heavenly golden dragon god emperor star ancestor. But it's okay, since there are still about 3,000 chapters to go, and all the big dick characters 
monsters that could kill you with a fart are currently busy. So you can go and wipe out a Ding Dong clan, which obsessively wants you dead because you courted death by destroying the King Kong clan after its young master picked a fight with you over your jade-like beauty, childhood friend. Essentially, you're going to perform a bunch of opaque, esoteric, and poorly understood processes to help you reach a higher power level. There's three types of cultivation in this game, and I'm going to mispronounce all of them. Xian Dao, Shen Dao, and Physical. Xian Dao is most relevant because it makes up 90% of the game. Your process of cultivation is derived from Chinese internal alchemy, where instead of a cauldron, you use your body, and instead of reagents, you use your chi to form a golden core. Think of a philosopher's stone, except backwards. That's what a golden core is. Instead of drinking the elixir of life, we are the elixir of life. Xian Dao is unique since you can transcribe your knowledge to a manual. This means a single cultivator can study from every other law and become exponentially more powerful. This can lead to interesting situations where someone might learn skills they really weren't supposed to, such as a male cultivator learning lunar form from the sunflower refining law and by doing so, reversing his sex. Becoming female in this game results in the loss of your penis, which can be picked up and sold on the open market. You can even make money off this by regrowing your penis, which will, upon realizing that you're not meant to have one, detach immediately. Each time you harvest a crop of penis, you become the dick farmer. But I digress. To reach a higher power level, you have to perform a breakthrough. This is essentially a bottleneck in your training, which you have to overcome or you can't progress. Golden Core, however, is different. It is the single most important breakthrough of your career. Every condition has to be perfect. The season, the weather, the time of day, the mental state of a cultivator, the element of a room, the chi density, and the amount of chi flowing through the cultivator's meridians. Get all those right and you just might get a better result than I did. I genuinely thought I did pretty good for my first time. Tier 9, I thought to myself, that's a pretty high number. Tier 9 is the lowest tier of Golden Core. It is trash. Literally, swallow a rebirth pill and reincarnate yourself, my man. You fucked up. Early on, your Golden Cores are gonna suck, but with experience comes knowledge, and once you learn how, you'll be making some fat cores on a regular. Then, there's Shendao cultivation. Instead of cultivating your chi, you take in the chi of others through worship. Belief is power, and the more people believe in you, the more powerful you become. Once you establish yourself as a divine being with a realm of heaven, you can be the petty god you've always wanted. As a rule, I only answer bad prayers. Drought, bandits, famine, refuse. Don't waste my time. You wish that tomorrow your favorite brothel prostitute hasn't been taken? Granted. You want your boss to step in dog shit? Granted. You want the guy who stole from you to be struck by lightning? My pleasure. You want those annoying neighbors next door to die in horrific agony? Me too. You want someone to celebrate your birthday with you this year? Granted. At some point, I learned to stop worrying and love Shandao. Also, they get the most ridiculous titles. Just imagine that every prayer addressed to you has to be prefaced with Dear Primordial, True Venerated, Great Pardon, Supreme Virtue, Venerated, Holy Emperor. That leaves us with physical cultivation. What is physical cultivation? It's an inner disciple that spent the last 50 days remolding his phallus. Due to the mental state bonus of having a gigantic penis, he is now physically immune to depression. In all seriousness, you take a mortal and you turn him into a Super Saiyan. Every body part, limb, joint, bone, and organ of your body you can remold until you become Goku. And then you give him intense PTSD so he can channel those repressed memories to increase his attack power from 1 million to 7 million and one shot the entire game. Also, since every yogurt comes from a different animal, they all have unique anatomy that's different to humans, which means for every species of demon you turn to physical cultivation there's tissue, bones, and organs not found anywhere else. In other words, fuck your opposable thumbs. I got vertebrae fused to my carapace. Sooner or later, your sect is gonna be attacked by bandits, demons, or other cultivators. With the exception of physical cultivators, which remove organs with their bare hands, Xian Dao and Shen Dao cultivators fight using artifacts. What is an artifact? Well, anything. A Kleenex tissue, a bowl of ramen, a bag of flour, a bucket of water, a pile of shit, 
severed male genitalia. As long as you enchant it, you can use it. Preferably, try to enchant an actual weapon. Although, you can't deny it's very demoralizing to see your fellow bandit get decapitated by blue fabric summer shirt. Combat is basically your guys sit around and watch as their artifacts cut everyone to pieces. It's pretty fun to watch, especially larger battles, where the sky is nothing but swords. Of course, no cultivation is complete without embracing traditional Chinese medicine. That's right alchemy. Here's a good summary of what alchemy is like. Change the weather. Lose 20 years of your natural lifespan, which may sound bad, until you visit the local Chinese pharmacy and pop a pill which adds 500, another which adds 280, and wash it all down with some mineral water which adds another 99. Now the only thing you have to cure is perpetual baby face, which is a common symptom when you have a lifespan of 3000. You want something done? Yeah, there's a pill for that. Obesity? No problem. Not a enough? I gotcha. Would you like to prank a demon? Force feed him a rebirth pill and he'll reincarnate right back into a piece of pork on your dinner plate. The cycle of karma is a fickle mistress. Honestly, if alchemy made any more sense, I'd actually be upset. Now, uh, if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna put myself in a coma for three days. About 30 days in, you're gonna get a pet. A divine pet. This is different to normal pets, which you adopt into your sect by shooting them with hunting bows, which are somehow blunt and tipped with anesthetic. This may sound very stupid, but on the other hand, Gundo Musashi had bullets that put you to sleep, and that was a masterpiece. Anyway, he starts off as a baby and grows larger with time. He's also a little shit, and you're gonna have to keep an eye on him before he destroys your sect. For example, my friend saw one of his cultivators doing a breakthrough, and he thought to himself, fuck, my man is literally shitting himself. This is one intense breakthrough. Turned out his dog was feeding laxatives to all of his inner disciples. It is your responsibility to teach them right from wrong. Peasants slacking on the job? Yes. Attack outer disciples. Give them some cardio. Drug inner disciples with euphoria pills? Why not? Give them some opium. An injured stranger wants our help? Yes. Attack unknown mortals. Kill them. Whether you raise him to be a functional member of society or a four-legged sociopath is entirely up to you. You can even rename him to something a little more Chinese. If you include the Bamboo Forest DLC, which adds a pair of pandas, there's five pets in total. They're incredibly cute and generally amazing. At the beginning, your sect can only hold 12 members. This increases to 24, then 36 as your reputation increases. Reputation also increases the power level of invading enemies. Don't let this number get out of control or you'll experience firsthand what it's like to lose a 50-hour game in five seconds, which is a good time to inform you that in this game, you can draw Chinese talismans with your mouse, the accuracy of which determines the blessing. You can even draw on a blank sheet of paper and it's still gonna work. I know this because Somebody drew a swastika, and apparently they can now use the oven 12% faster. So please draw a bunch of invisibility scrolls and wear them when you go on adventures. Your sect will thank you each time they haven't been murdered in your absence. It's not easy to make stacks in this game, which is why we have to trick villagers into filling our ranks. We do this by making small talk, finding out that half of them love nothing more than to ravenously consume shit and invite them over. Because we're gonna need a lot of manpower for our Chinese sweatshop as inner disciples cultivate immortality. Outer disciples cultivate huge plantations of cotton. We're gonna process that down to fabric, and we're gonna wait, because very soon a merchant is gonna show up. He operates on a sweatshop economy. He's gonna pay you garbage, so you better have a high volume of garbage to sell. Luckily, our emaciated peasants have worked hard this summer, and we just earned 10,000 spirit stones. We're gonna celebrate by losing it instantaneously, because the merchant also sells an invitation to an exclusive event. Read the token, and we're off to the auction house. Have you ever gone to an auction where you can't even see what's being sold, but instead are given a vague description? Hard. Lumpy. A man's hand shoots up. I'll take it for 10,000. Not to be outdone, I raise his offer. I'll take it for 12,000. Another joins in. 13. Another raises. 14. The rest fold because they're poor as fuck. Those who remain keep raising. Eventually, there's only two of us. One final raise. 56,000. I won the bid. But I don't have 56,000. But, uh, they don't know that. The auction ends. It's time to pay. I can't pay. I am under arrest, but I'm not because I am a mannequin made of straw. I never went to the auction. I took a clone pill and sent my body double. And that is a good summary of the auction house experience. It's not about what we bid on. It's about why we do it. We do it 
to flex on the poor. While keeping a low profile is important, you should expand when given the chance. You see, your sect is local, but we can export the culture, the lifestyle, and the religion to the rest of fantasy China. To do this, we establish agencies. Then we set a policy for each region and grow our influence. Depending on the policy, you get random events, which have to be solved using insanity. You get a bunch of buttons, which I assume is what a paranoid schizophrenic's dialogue options look like, and you press whichever one you think is appropriate to the situation. Options include talk, bribe, kill, seduce, or throw a rock at someone and stone them to death. Foreigner scamming the locals? Murder him. Another sect is preaching about their faith? Pay them a hundred spirit stones to fuck off. Is it currently Ramadan in the Great Desert? Start handing out food. Believe me, the longer you do it, the more sense it makes, or the more warped and psychopathic your reasoning becomes. For example, you're building a wonder and some people drop by to ask what you're doing. Wrong answer, debate Feng Shui. Correct answer, beat them with a club. If you solve stuff correctly, you get a bunch more followers. Followers can dig up natural resources, generate belief that converts into experience, completely skipping the grind of cultivation, and be sacrificed for the greater good. You see, we're gonna need a lot of anguished soul gems, which are formed from a painful death in ominous Feng Shui. Luckily, with agencies, there's no shortage of fresh and willing mortals. With reputation you can build a sect gate. This is the front door, where hopeful mortals arrive to prostrate themselves, begging to be recruited. But instead, we're going to build a hell gate, which is the same gate, but in a room with ominous feng shui at a comfortably cool temperature of absolute zero. We're gonna recruit mortals from every city. They will arrive, pray to hell gate, and freeze to death in horrific agony. And the negative moral consequence of such an action? zero, because they have died through no fault of our own. This is a good time to introduce alignment. Your sect can be good or evil, but preferably we want a balance, so we have good relations with both the virtuous and the demonic. This game exemplifies the Chinese practice of moral relativity. Hmm, what are they doing there? What are they, protesters? If I horrifically mutilate someone's dying body to extract the location of their friends and family, that's slightly evil. But as long as you give them a proper burial, that's a net new neutral action, and we have done nothing wrong. Or let's say a curious stranger comes by to ask what you're doing, and then stands there waiting for an answer, until he collapses from extreme first, at which point I feed him a laxative and watch him shit himself to death. Is it wrong to watch a dying man's ass fertilize my fields? No, not at all. But if I turn a bandit's dead, broken body into a flesh puppet to serve us economically until it rots away, that's considered evil. A bigger question, I guess is if I get decapitated by a dragon while adventuring, fly back home without a head, and use Yang God possession to transfer my consciousness into the body of another man's wife, would that make me a homosexual? Some questions have no clear answer. Have you ever frozen to death during winter because the wall of your house stood up and walked away? Unfortunately, in this game, that's a frequent occurrence. Without warning, anything on the map can gain sentience. Sentient objects can also randomly enter the map as I've seen entire pagodas march in and flatten my base. What's the point of them? To grief you. But more seriously, you can turn them into a 14-year-old boy. What is the application of this? Well, you can take a shit, give it sentience, and turn it into a human, who you're going to call Big Chungus, because the guys on Discord data mined the Chinese code and found out that specific set of Latin characters ensures that the sentient spirit will generate with the highest stats possible. Then, you're gonna make a literal piece of shit become a demigod and a Send to heaven, and that's what cultivation is all about. By the way, everyone who ever goes to heaven, whether by death or ascension, gets a little epilogue section, so you can follow the shenanigans of former disciples. Here's a sample of the literary gems you might encounter. Ming Wu reincarnated as an ant, but got drowned to death by a mean child who peed on the ant nest. Then he reincarnated into a parrot, but because he learned a lot of profanities and was swearing all day, someone plucked out his feathers and he froze to death. And in his next life as a human, he met a strange acting boy. And believing him to be an immortal in disguise that could teach him cultivation, he took him in as his own. However, as it turned out, the child was actually mentally retarded. Later on, you'll find out combat gets a little more complicated, with the introduction 
of formations. To understand what that is, go to another sect and try stealing. The moment you do so, a gigantic bubble forms in the sky and tears you to pieces. This is called a formation. The leader of it is called the pillar, and everyone around them an auxiliary. It follows the rules of Feng Shui, so different elements will feed each other as they flow back to the pillar. It might look very oriental, but honestly, it's just Chinese Lego. What's the point of formations? To deal with a little cave that appears in our base after about 200 days. If you're not ready and you need to suppress it, give it a nice room. This will buy you some time, but Whatever you do, don't give it offerings. It's going to break out anyway, but your sacrifices will make it stronger. So we may as well piss it off. Welcome to the official casual filter. The first boss you're going to encounter is the Flood Dragon, and it has a chi of about 10 million. Good luck. Honestly, if you get to the stage, congrats. Now swallow your pride, go read a bunch of guides, and install some mods. It'll improve your life greatly. I'll attach the ones I use below. There's nothing essential, but when you have to micromanage the mental state of about 18 different cultivators, it does get tiresome. Listen, I've been writing the script for close to a month. There's no way to include everything, and I want my life back. So here's a stream of consciousness before I give an arbitrary score, and go live in the woods. Each sect has a wonder. Yours is no exception. Go to the ruins of a Taiyi sect and bring it back. The mini universe is a game changer. It's an infinite pocket plane that sucks in material and spits it out. But could there be a deeper, more mysterious function? No, it's just storage. No longer will your peasants have to walk for nourishment, because the best soups of a Wuhan wet market are gonna fly right into their hands. After killing your first flood dragon, which will always, without fail, crash its body into one of my expensive cultivation rooms, the game removes all safety checks. You can now summon the Phoenix, which creates 10 days of extreme drought, during which time your base is going to burn to the ground, because you forgot to move a single Phoenix feather, which landed in a bedroom and turned the temperature to about twice the melting point of steel. After 10 days of drought, it doesn't stop. It's permanent. The only way to end it is with a rainstorm miracle, which will make your Phoenix very upset. It's stronger than the Flood Dragon, by the way. Also, you can't kill a Phoenix each time you you do, it's just gonna reincarnate. Maybe I should have mentioned that earlier. Again, good luck. Then there's the Torch Dragon, which is larger than the entire screen and comes in a yin-yang variant, respective to the time of day. Each variant is invincible to elements of the same polarity, and even worse, they make him stronger. Also, he's gonna lay a bunch of eggs. You should probably just ignore them. And if you survive all that, there's really one challenge left. Genociding every other sect and beating them into submission. Once that's done, you can truly say, I finished the game. Now you can go back and play on the real difficulty. I do, however, have some major complaints. Remember the story? The plot? Weren't we supposed to investigate the mystery of a Taiyi sect and why it was destroyed? Yes, but the process of doing so is so terrible that I'm just gonna save you the pain and tell you instead. You see, every character that's not your own can be interacted with, and we uncover the plot through the talking minigame. Primarily, this is done by adventuring to another sect. You talk to people, you get favor. After a while, you don't get favor. You only get favor from juicy gossip. So you have to talk to another character, learn something about them, go back to the first character, and tell them a secret about the second. But to get the secret from the second, I'll have to talk to 20 other people to have enough gossip and rumors to trade for more gossip and rumors. It's an infinite web of high school bullshit. It's the experience of being a teenage girl. Because you can't get the information you need directly. You have to go through the PMS, chain of command to learn absolutely anything. Now, here's the big problem. You might see a little question mark on someone next to the mystery tab. These are the people you need to investigate to solve the mystery. Again, you have to ask an entire sorority if they think that person knows something. If you ask them face to face without circumstantial evidence, they'll act dumb and say nothing. And even if you know that they know, they still have to open up to give you that information, which is dependent on their personality. If they're naive, that's the best case scenario, because you don't have to do anything. If they're greedy, you have to bribe them. If they're weak, you have to kill them. If they're tough, you have to gaslight their personal weakness. But if they're withdrawn, unfortunately, you are screwed. Because the only way to make a withdrawn person open up is to make your spirit dog act 
playful in front of them. This requires a fully grown spirit dog, which can take hundreds of days, and each time you do it, he loses intelligence from the retardation of this minigame, which takes 10 to 20 days to recover. About 20 hours in, my eyes bloodshot and attention slipping, I managed to solve the first two mysteries. You do this by finding clues, participants, and motives, and slapping them together. The more you find, the more complete and accurate your solution is. Then, I talked to the next five characters, and they were all withdrawn, and I quit the game. I have never seen a story mechanic that's more laborious, difficult, and poorly fought out. But it doesn't end there. It gets better. You can do all of that and still hardlock yourself from completing the game because you didn't pick the right option for a specific event on day 565. Or you waited too long and someone essential to the plot has died of old age. Still, I wasn't entirely sure about the story, so I had to bring in the expert, resident merchant, aficionado of Ben 10 porn, and mentioned on several no-fly listings across Thailand. Hello, my nigga. I, I become rap people because I eat watermelon. Jap. His hard drive died about five times while explaining, but here's the gist of it. The Thai -E sect was attacked. By who? By everyone. Both the evil and virtuous sect leaders conspired together to wipe it out. But what could justify such a strange alliance? because the old leader of the Tai Yi sect is none other than the demon emperor Fu Pekong, who is currently inside your mini-universe. If you talk to him, you'll get your answers. You see, cultivation is difficult, but it's also strangely common to see someone go from mortal to demigod in just a few weeks. That's because this world isn't real. Overwhelmed by demons, the elders left the great vastness of the universe to this pocket universe, where cultivation is quick, but the creed of heaven is weakening, and once it fails, this universe will end. They took a shortcut to artificial power, and now they're trying their best to hold on. In the final act, a cutscene plays, and Fu Pekong undoes the universe, throwing us back into the great vastness. Everyone is mortal again, but this time, we can do it for real. Finally, a title card drops. Coming in 2023. Bug Snacks 2. And that's the story of Amazing Cultivation Simulator. So, you never have to go through that horrific experience. In conclusion, I give Amazing Cultivation Simulator 10 out of 10 euphoria pills. I hate it. It's like the Opium Wars, except in this case, the Chinese are winning. If you're interested, you can get a copy on Steam. Also, it's coming to GOG on the 23rd of July. This is made possible thanks to Polish Greed and my growing alliance with a CCP, because I like to bet on the winning team. And right now, now, that's Team China. A warm thanks to the many members of a Merchants Guild generously funding and bankrolling these videos. You're all truly wonderful. Have a good one. Thank you.